So uh, just a welcome to all of those who are yeah. tuning in over Zoom. This, uh, I think it's not very clear. Photo is not clear. Did you see? Did you see? Marcia, can you repeat what did you say? Can you write in chat? Why is this not clear? The video is not clear. The video. Voice okay. The voice? Video. video. Asad, it's a video that's not clear. Video. Video is not clear. Um, can you hear me now? All right. How is it now, Vishnishanka? Yeah, better. Yeah, better? much better, yes. I can hear now. Yes, 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 yes. I can hear. Much better. Okay, we're going to be starting with the uh... Uh, questions and answers uh, session from the people who are here in person at this uh, retreat. Uh, this is based on a talk that I gave uh, today. And it says, what reason did you select the Mahasi Sayada meditation method for the path of awakening? What was the method at the place you trained? Well, the first meditation course uh, that I went to in Nepal, as I mentioned, actually it was a it was a Tibetan meditation course. So it was a course on the what was called the Lam Lam Rim, uh, which is a basic sort of intellectual Buddhist uh, uh, study, or it's a, it's a, you know, how the, the Tibetan Buddhists introduce uh, people to the Dhamma. And basically it covers all the basic topics that you find in Theravada as well. It uh, covered the Four Noble Truths. It covered the, you know, suffering and greed, hatred and delusion, and uh, you know, basically the standard uh, Buddhist sort of uh, topics. But it also focused on cultivating bodhicitta, which means uh, that we are, our practice of the Dhamma and meditation. We're not doing it only for ourselves but we're doing it uh, for the sake of others too, for being able to, uh, you know, uh, have that uh, like metta for all living beings and, uh, you know, sharing the Dhamma with, with others. So it's, you know, it's a Mahayana, the Tibetan system is, you know, a Mahayana tradition, uh, but very strong on the Bodhisattva uh, idea. I'm not going to go into all that. But anyway, so, uh, and as I mentioned, it was, I mentioned that there's three uh, levels of understanding or wisdom. It's first the intellectual level, and then you have to go on thinking about what you've read or heard about. So it kind of sticks in your mind and, and goes deeper and reflecting on those things in your daily life, like seeing how the law of karma is operating and how your actions follow you around and have their you know, consequences. And, uh, and then also meditating. So in that course, we had a book that had these topics in it. So we, had, we, were, we were to read one chapter and then right after that, the Lama would give a lecture on, on that. And then we would sit and meditate on that. So we were doing all three of those levels. We were, uh, you know, 
reading a chapter on you know the intellectual uh, teaching and then the lama would expound on that in more uh, detail and then we would meditate on it so it wasn't just reading something and then you know forgetting about it so we were doing those three the same topic but covering it three times one on intellectual level one on uh, a more a detailed uh, analysis of of that and then sitting to uh, recall that in our own mind and uh, uh, running it through our own mind and so but there was no what you would call real like uh, there was meditation there was some breathing meditation but it was some specific kind of preparatory meditations like you know uh, watching your breath and some alternate nostril breathing and some visualization and and so on but uh, mostly it was to really instill in you uh, the urgency to practice and uh, for uh, you know developing that uh, bodhicitta and uh, you know the compassion and de dedicating our practice toward helping all other beings so that was that one month uh, course but uh, you know you get very concentrated doing that anyway uh, coming back to this question okay now the second meditation course i took was a goenka vipassana 10-day course so a 10-day course in vipassana and uh that was after, about a month after I took this Tibetan course and I went down to Buddha Gaya and I took this Vipassana course. And that was the course that uh, this person had been explaining to me uh, uh, when I was on a trek uh, in, in Nepal and which got me interested to, to meditate. Uh, and that so that Goenka course is mainly a kind of Kaya Anupasana, a meditation on, on the body and body sensations and, and, and so on. It's, you know, it, it is Vipassana, but it focuses primarily on uh, Anicca, impermanence. To, to, you know, scanning through the body and see how the body is just Rupa Kalapas or, you know, just cells and atoms and just momentary vibrations that are arising and vanishing and learning how to sit through pain and things like that. Uh, and, and oftentimes that's called the boot camp of uh, Buddhist meditation. Because, you know, they, from day one, they have you sitting one hour, you know, and that's pretty rough for people who, you know, never meditated before. But, and, uh, you know, having about six or seven hours of, of, of full hours of meditation every day for 10 days straight. So it's uh, sort of like being boot camp in the army. Now this Mahasi uh, technique that I had mentioned today, was after the Goenka course, I was staying in Budgaya Langa and uh, Joseph Goldstein uh, was giving some lectures in the Burmese Vihara and uh, you know most of the Dhamma bums were going there to listen to uh, those talks I, I went there and he was explaining this uh, basically the moment to moment uh, mindfulness and basically the, the Mahasi system of uh, noting the moments and also doing very slow uh, movements with the body, you know, and, and uh, doing it very slowly. So you see how each movement is is just a very short movement, like lifting, you know, lifting, lifting, or walking meditation, uh, especially, uh, you know, the, er, noting every movement of the body. And uh, that sounded very interesting. Uh, and so I resolved that I, I, w I wanted to go to a a course in that. Now, in the meantime, I, I was reading a lot of books 
on Theravada suttas, like Satipatthana Sutta and other uh, books, and was getting up. Because up to that point, I hadn't read a lot uh, of a Theravada material. Uh, but then once I you know, came down to Bud Gaya, where there was a, you know, Sri Lankan monks and other, other places that some books were available, and I started getting interested in Vipassana. So I went to, uh, took that uh, Mahasi course, and <clears throat> based on that, I realized that the Mahasi course was a more complete form of Vipassana because it focused on all six senses, not just the body. And it had you turning into impermanence on all six senses and noting each moment and hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, like, you know, this uh, frames of a movie reel that I uh, mentioned. And, and focusing on anatta, more anatta, not only a Nietzsche, but anatta. And uh, so that I felt was a more complete method because it followed the Satipatthana more closely than just the Goenka system. So therefore, I, I spent most of my time developing that uh, uh, method of Mahasi method. But, you know, I, because I was training in, in yoga and other things, I still incorporated some aspects even some of the Tibetan Mahayana prayers, I was using those because they're very powerful. And, uh, you know, sometimes visualizing a Buddha image that they have you do in, in uh, Tibetan practice. And so, you know, I wasn't following any technique, you know, by the book as you have to do when you go to these, you know, organized courses. But the general understanding was that the Mahasi method of Vipassana was a more complete form of vipassana and follow the, the Satipatthana Sutta uh, more than just the, the Goenka body scan. Because it had, to, it had you note your thoughts and, uh, and everything, you know, and the six senses, it covered the six senses, the five aggregates, uh, uh, Dhamma Nofasana and so on. It's not that I just follow one technique to enlighten us. You know, techniques are just are there to get your mind on the right track. And then, uh, you know, once you understood and you followed the certain techniques and you understood the, the limitations of the technique or the, and the benefits of the technique, and, uh, and when you have a larger understanding of the complete Dhamma, then you learn how to weave in your own practice, you know, how to uh, tailor those kind of teachings. Like, for example, you know, I add yoga into it, you know, that's my, I'm the only Buddhist monk that ever does that. And uh, I got criticized in the beginning for doing that even. Uh, but since then, most people, uh, you know, accepted that, that, you know, yoga can be a good thing, but still, that's the kind of a specialty of my uh, teaching is that I, I saw that that was a, a powerful way to help initially get concentrated and uh, getting the, the benefits of, of, of that. So, but still using that basic uh, practice of tuning into impermanence and, you know, once you're getting grounded in the body, then opening up to the flow of impermanence, but not just in the body, but to all the six senses and uh, cultivating the, you know, the perception of uh, uh, anatta as well. So. This question, uh, if everyone's experience is individual and you talk about 
the first and second jhanas. Uh, well, I might have said, you know, everyone's experience is individual, it is, because it's within your own mind. We can be practicing, you know, the same sort of method, but still each person is experiencing that method or doing it, the effects of that are in one, one's own mind that somebody else is not going to actually see, but there would be similarities that occur in, in the minds of people that are practicing certain things, but it's not going to be exactly the same because each person's mind is different, you know, even to small, you know, varying degrees, which is uh, going to make it, you know, a very individual uh, experience. And even when you come for an interview and explain your experience to a teacher, unless the teacher can read your mind or so on, uh, you know, is from what you're explaining to the teacher, they then, uh, you know, offer some advice or uh, something, but still the way you explain it may not be exactly the way you experienced it. And, and so anyway, the whole point is that, you know, meditation is an individual practice, even though we can be sitting in a group if we went through and asked people what they experience, almost every single person would say something different. Even though I told you to practice the same thing, uh, everyone would give different, uh, some similarities, of course, but some differences as well, because they're limited by their hindrances and uh, their, the level of their practice as to what they're going to get out of um, any meditation period at any uh, given time because everything is, is, is so much changing. Now, coming back to the, uh, this question about the jhanas, uh, <clears throat> basically, you know, those are uh, descriptions of when the mind becomes uh, concentrated. Because, you know, when you start meditating, you have the hindrances that we've already talked about a lot. And those have to be greatly weakened uh, before you begin to uh, experience deeper meditation. Uh, and uh, the first jhana has characteristics of what are called applied and sustained thought. That means either it can be applied and sustained attention, like you apply your attention to uh, the breathing, and then you try to keep it on the breathing. But in the beginning, you can't keep it on the breathing because the mind wanders, and then you have to bring it back. So you have to apply the mind again, and again, and again, and over and over and over, until finally the mind stays on that object longer time and that becomes sustained attention. So the sustained thought is the power of the mind that's keeping that applied thought on its mark without the hindrances uh, you know, intervening. So that's applied and sustained thought. Uh, and it can actually be a thought too, like, you know, you can attain the first jhana or more even like reciting metta phrases, may all beings be well and happy, or, or something like that, or chanting a mantra. Uh, so it, it can actually be thought too, like repeating the words sitting, breathing, sitting, breathing, or in, in, sitting, out, out, sitting. If you could actually follow that and feel that without any intervening thoughts coming in, you would attain the first jhana too, because it's a very limited amount of thought. Now, there is some differences of opinion between different meditation masters. They will say, no, 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 that's wrong. Oh, have differences of opinions about it. But anyway, so the applied and sustained thought. Now, because the mind is no longer wandering and it is concentrated, then you get also the piti and the sukha, which means a rapture or bliss and a joy, which is Rapture is more of a physical sensation, like the feeling of, you know, the kind of a 
you know, tingling sensations or the rapture waves of energy going through the body, like your hair standing on in. Uh, and also what I mentioned in the yoga. When you're doing the yoga exercises, deep breathing, and you're doing some stretching like that, you can feel kind of, you know, some kind of pleasant sensations going up and down different places, and sometimes it can be very uh, strong. So that is also, uh, that is a, a form of piti too. Uh, so even by doing the yoga, you can get, you can actually enter a jhana by doing yoga exercise too, if you're, if you, if you're doing it in the right way. But anyway, so that is the first jhana, is the uh, applied and sustained attention, which suppresses the, all the, the hindrances. And then because of that, you feel these blissful sensations. And that's because the mind is in the present moment. And those blissful sensations are, are basically, you're experiencing the cellular, molecular, vi vibratory vibration of the nervous system. In my, in my view, in, in my understanding of it. Um, so, and then the fifth jhana factor is one-pointedness. That means the mind is not being distracted. Now, one-pointedness has a, uh, it's one-pointed, a lot of people think that means being absorbed into one point, but that's not entirely accurate or not the only meaning of it. It could be, but it means the one point is the present moment. That means the mind has gone to one, the present moment. It's not wandering. So when the mind is resting in the present moment, that is also one-pointedness. Uh, because the point is the present moment. Objects are coming and going through it, but those objects are coming and going, but the awareness is not coming and going. It's just like a mirror. And so that's the, that's a, also the, the definition of one point in this that I prefer to, uh, uh, you know, describe. Because this idea of getting absorbed in, you know, some one object and losing awareness of everything else, that's, uh, that's more like a formless jhana. But anyway, I'm not going to go into all that. So, uh, and the second jhana is basically when the applied and sustained thought uh, subsides. And so there's no more any initial words or uh, thinking. And you don't know, no longer have to apply or sustain anything. The mind is fully concentrated. So there's no more effort to concentrate. Because the mind is fixed there. And there's no more uh, mental chatter. Did yoga exist at the time of the Buddha as a practice to complement concentration? Like within the other Hindu traditions. Now the idea that Buddha practiced yoga, the only time that the Buddha mentioned yoga was he had two terms for it, Atta Kilamatani Yoga in Kama Sukalakani Yoga, which means indulging in sensual pleasure and indulging in self-mortification. So at the time of the Buddha, the ascetic monks thought by kind of torturing your body by subjecting it to unnecessary, you know, pains, uh, starving it, sitting out in the extreme heat and cold, doing some postures where they're standing on one leg for hours and hours until, you know, they get some damage from it and various types of ascetic disciplines, sleeping on a bed of nails and, and doing some really bizarre uh, mutilation of the body, you could say. So the Buddha was against that. 
uh, and he tried it, some of it, but he, he, he said, no, nah, nah, this is not the way. And he took the middle path. So in terms of the Buddha actually practicing yoga as we know it, in terms of, you know, 508 different asanas and 37 pranayamas and so on, there's no mention of that in the Buddhist texts. But people can extrapolate and conjure it up, but we don't know exactly. Um, but the, the Buddha was mainly talking, when he mentioned yoga in that context, it was simply about the sensual indulgence, the two extremes of sensual indulgence and, and depriving yourself of any type of uh, pleasant sensation. Because that was what the yogis thought, if you deprived yourself of every kind of sensual pleasure, that that would somehow get you to get, you know, reach liberation. So, but of course, the, the, the only yoga posture that the Buddha actually mentioned was the Padma Asana, or the full lotus posture, which is associated with, you know, uh, Buddhist uh, statues. That's the only asana that, uh, at least in my understanding or my reading and so on, that the, the Buddha actually talked about is the meditation posture. Uh, so, anybody have any uh, follow up questions on? Yes. So uh, I appreciate the fact that you synthesize uh, like yoga with meditation, Buddhist meditation. Have you, in your practice, um, like in in yoga, you talk about the ch the chakras, the energy centers. Has it come to your attention when your mind became more Kind of those chakras, or is it here? In the uh, Theravada tradition, there's, in, from my understanding, all, I'm not a Pali expert, so I don't understand all the Pali words that are being used, but the Buddha didn't talk uh, much about chakras. Now, in Tibetan Buddhism, they do, because Tibetan Buddhism is closer to yoga you know, because it comes from, uh, you know, Sanskrit. And so there's a lot of yogic influence in Tibetan teachings, but not in Theravada teachings. But the idea of chakras, basically those are, you know, if you understand the physiology uh, behind the chakras, you know, there are certain uh, uh, vortices of energy in the body uh, you know, seven of them, uh, main chakras, uh, where energy sort of, uh, you know, is accumulate or they're associated with certain traits. Uh, and the idea in yoga, of course, is to raise that energy out of the lower chakras and raise it up uh, through the various to open the chakras so that energy can raise up. This is kind of like Kundalini uh, philosophy. Uh, so it's a little bit complicated. The Buddha never talked about that directly, but it happens even when you meditate. Now in yoga, they have specific practices to open up these chakras and certain asanas and other types of cleansing techniques. Uh, but you know, basically, it said, if your mind is occupied with food, sex, and sleep, that means your energy is focused down in your <laughs> lower chakras. And then, so, you know, if, if your mind is preoccupied with that when you meditate, then you can assume that that's where your, your energy is going. Uh, but then when you, uh, when you start to practice metta, for example, and you start to practice and get more concentration, that's associated with the heart chakra and the, the 
the throat chakra and even the uh, chakra, the sixth chakra behind the eyes, the deeper states of meditation and the love and so on, less ego. So that means uh, your focus is out of your gonads and, you know, getting up into, you know, more love and compassion for others. And then, uh, especially in the fifth and sixth chakras, that's where you start attaining jhanas. Uh, and, uh, and even the second chakra, or seventh chakra is said to be the transcendental, uh, you know, liberation. Uh, but anyway, it's, so there's no talk about that directly. But when you practice meditation, it automatically raises your consciousness up. But no doubt, if people, you know, like tamasic kind, if you're eating a bunch of junk food and, and all kind of other impurities and your, your negative thoughts too, that means your, your, your energy is going to be pretty much blocked down in that area. It's going to be much more difficult for you to uh, attain uh, deeper levels of concentration because those are hindrances. And so until you are able to overcome the hindrances, suppress them, you're not going to attain concentration. So the hindrances basically are the mind that's bottled up down there in the first, second, and third chakras. And then finally, getting into the fourth, it starts to open up. Uh, so that's the way that I would kind of uh, explain it. It's a very cursory explanation. But... Any other uh, questions? I think I saw another hand start to come up in some wonderful. Any other question? No. Okay, so then we will uh, we'll go on to uh, now do our uh, puja and then uh, meditation. So this puja is going to be in two sections. We're going to do this the standard one that we've been reciting in the last uh, three nights, uh, reading it. And then there's some other uh, aspects of an extended puja that we're going to just be listening uh, in a kind of a, you know, meditative state, listening to the chanting. And I'm going to be uh, giving the English meaning of those uh, chants uh, while uh, the Pali chanting is going on, so you can you know, hear that meaning and kind of try to reflect on uh, the meanings of those. And then when that is over, then we will just uh, then go into meditation after that. <coughs> so because we're kind of doing this maybe for the first time, where there could be some little technical uh, issues where uh, we have to make a pause or or something. Uh, but if anything happens, you know, instead of wondering what's going on, well, you know, just stay there and be in your meditation. You know, just stay with the body and uh, just come back to your breathing and uh, until. Uh, we uh, continue, okay? So do our guests have the uh, puja, evening puja paper?
Supati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sangu Sangam Namami Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sangu Dasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddham Saranam Gacchami Dhammam saranam gacchami Sangam saranam gacchami Dutiyampi buddhyam saranam gacchami Dutiyampi dhammam saranam gacchami Dutiyampi sangam saranam gacchami Tatiyampi buddham saranam gacchami Tatiyampi dhammam saranam gacchami Tatiyampi sangam saranam gacchami Recite the eight precepts. <coughs> eight four path precepts. I undertake the training group who have seen from taking life. I undertake the training group who have seen from taking what is not given. I undertake the training group who have seen from sensual misconduct. I undertake the training group who have seen from false speech. I undertake the training group to abstain from religious speech. I undertake the training group to abstain from harsh speech. I undertake the training group to abstain from useless speech. I undertake the training group to abstain from wrong livelihood and from intoxicating drinks and drugs causing illness. Turn over to page three, uh, two. Such indeed is the Buddha, worthy, perfectly enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, well gone, knower of the worlds, supreme trainer of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and exalted, well expounded is the Dhamma by the Buddha, directly visible, unaffected by time, calling one to come and see leading onwards to be realized by the wise. The order of the Buddha's disciples is practicing well. They are of upright conduct. They have entered the right path. They are practicing correctly. That is, the four pairs of persons, the eight kinds of individuals. This order of the Buddha's disciples is worthy of offerings and hospitality, worthy of gifts and salutations. Supreme field of merit for the world. With candle lights dispelling dark, I respect the perfect Buddha, the light of the triple worlds, who dispels the darkness of delusion. With these flowers, I respect the Buddha. By this merit, may I gain liberation. As these flowers fade and wither, so will this body decay and die. All actions are led by the mind. Mind is their master, mind is their maker. 
act or speak with an impure mind, then suffering follows, as the cartwheel follows the foot of the ox. And in the same way, if one acts or speaks with a pure mind, then happiness follows, as your shadow follows you around. If due to negligence I have done some wrong, by body, speech, or mind, forgive me of that offense, O Bhante, perfect one of vast wisdom. Forgive me of that offense, O Dhamma, visible and unaffected by time. Forgive me of that offense, O Sangha, practicing well and supreme. I have gained a vast mass of merit, respecting the honorable triple gem. By the spiritual power of that merit, may my obstacles be destroyed. By means of these meritorious deeds, may I never join with the foolish, may I always join with the wise until the time I attain Nibbana. May the suffering be free from suffering, may the fear struck be free from fear, May the grieving be free from grief, so too may all beings live. And now let's turn over to uh, page three, and we're going to recite the uh, Metta Sutta again. One skilled in goodness Wishing to attain that state of peace should act thus. One should be able, straight, upright, obedient, gentle, and humble. One should be content, easy to support, with few duties, living lightly, controlled in senses, discreet, not impudent, unattached to families. One should not do any slight wrong which the wise might censor. May all beings be happy and secure, whatever living beings there may be, without exception, weak or strong, long or short, gross, medium or subtle, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth. May all beings have joyful, peaceful minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere. Neither in anger nor ill will should anyone wish harm to another, as a mother would risk her own life to protect her only child. Even so, towards all living beings, one should cultivate the boundless heart. One should cultivate for all the world a heart of boundless loving friendliness, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hatred or resentment, whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, or whenever awake, one should cultivate this mindfulness. This is called divinely dwelling here, not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision, removing desire for sensual pleasures. One comes not again to birth into any world. Excellent, excellent, excellent.
So uh, once this uh, the, the Pali chanting uh, starts, you know, just close your eyes and kind of just you know, try to just meditate with it. There's no need to look. Just listen to the the words and. Uh, Let's do some three-part breathing, try not to Just do some three-part breathing, stay in the body. Such indeed is the Sublime One, worthy, perfectly enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, well gone, knower of the worlds, Teacher of gods and humans. Can you turn up the volume a little? Enlightened and exalted. The Buddha well purified with ocean like compassion, possessed of the eye of knowledge completely purified, destroyer of the evils and corruption of the world. I revere that Buddha with devotion. Homage to you so nobly bred. Homage to you amongst men supreme. Peerless are you in all the world. May all homage be given to you. Well expounded is the Dhamma by the Sublime One. Directly visible, unaffected by time. 
calling one to come and see, leading onward to be realized by the wise. The teacher's Dhamma like a lamp. Divided into path, fruition and the deathless. Both itself transcendent and showing the way to that goal. I revere that Dhamma with devotion. Thoroughly understanding the Dhamma and freed from longing through insight, the wise one who is rid of all desire is calm as a pool unstirred by wind. Those to whom the Dhamma is clear are not led into other doctrines. Perfectly enlightened with perfect knowledge, they walk evenly over the uneven. Of all the medicines in the world, manifold and various, there's none like the medicine of Dhamma. Therefore, O monks, drink of this. Having drunk this Dhamma medicine, you will be ageless and beyond death. Having developed and seen the truth, you will be quenched, free from craving. The order of the Sublime One's disciples is practicing well. 
the order of the sublime one's disciples is of upright conduct. The order of the sublime one's disciples has entered the right path. The order of the sublime one's disciples is practicing correctly. That is the four pairs of persons, the eight kinds of individuals. This order, the sublime one's disciples, is worthy of offerings and hospitality. Worthy of gifts and salutations. Supreme field of merit for the world. The Sangha called a field better than the best, who have seen peace awakening after the Buddha's good way. who have abandoned attachment, the noble ones, the wise. I revere that Sangha with devotion. They go to many a refuge, those who have been struck by fear. They go to the mountains and forests, to parks and trees and shrines, but none of these is a secure refuge. None is the refuge supreme. Not by relying on such a refuge can one be freed from all suffering. But one who has gone for refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, sees with perfect wisdom the Four Noble Truths. Suffering, the arising of suffering, The transcending of suffering, and the Noble Eightfold Path, that leads to suffering's final end. This is the refuge that is secure. This is the refuge that is supreme. By relying on such a refuge as this, one is released from all suffering. I pay reverence to every shrine, the 
that may stand in any place. The bodily relics, the Bodhi tree, and all images of the Buddha. I have gained a vast mass of merit. Honoring the most honorable triple gem. By the spiritual power of that merit, may my obstacles be destroyed. with candle lights dispelling dark. I venerate the perfect Buddha. The light of the triple world. Who dispels the darkness of delusion. With this incense sweetly scented, made from fragrant substances, I venerate the one worthy of reverence. the supreme recipient of offerings. This cluster of flowers, beautiful, fragrant, and excellent, I offer it the holy lotus feet of the noble Lord of Sages. With these flowers I venerate the Buddha. By this merit may I gain liberation. As these flowers fade and wither, so will this body be destroyed. By this practice of Dhamma, If I have done some wrong by body, speech, or mind, forgive me of that offense, O Bhante, perfect one of vast wisdom. Forgive me of that offense, O Dhamma, visible and unaffected by time. If due to negligence I have done some wrong, by body, speech, or mind,
Forgive me of that offense, O Sangha. Practicing well and supreme. By this practice of Dhamma, in accord with the Dhamma, I venerate the Buddha. By this practice of Dhamma, in accord with the Dhamma, I venerate the Dhamma. By this practice of Dhamma, in accord with the Dhamma, I venerate the Sangha. By the blessings that have arisen from my practice, May my venerable preceptors and teachers who have helped me and mother, father, and relatives, male and female rulers, worldly powers, virtuous human beings, the higher beings and high gods, the guardian deities of the world, the Lord of death, friendly people, indifferent and hostile, May all beings be well. May the skillful deeds done by me bring you the threefold bliss. May this quickly bring you to the deathless. By the means of these meritorious deeds and through this aspiration, may I quickly attain the cutting off of craving and clinging. Whatever faults I have until I am liberated, may they quickly perish. Wherever I am born, may there be an upright mind, mindfulness and wisdom, austerity and vigor, May no harmful influences weaken my effort. The Buddha is the unsurpassed protector. Dhamma is the supreme protection. Peerless is the silent Buddhas. The Sangha is my true refuge.
by the power of these exalted ones. May I rise above all defilements. By the means of this meritorious deed, May I never join with the foolish. May I join always with the wise. Until the time I attain Nibbana. May the suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. So too may all beings be. From the highest realm of existence to the lowest. May all beings arisen in these realms. with form and without form, with perception and without perception, be released from all suffering and to attain to perfect peace. Excellent.